Hello, we welcome you to our Bible study. If you will, please turn to your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We'll, we, we will continue the study of the book of Ecclesiastes. And so again, turn to Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 1. Verse 1, he says, Then I returned and considered all the oppression that is done under the sun. And look, the tears of the oppressed, but they have no comforter. On the side of their oppressors, there is power, but they have no comforter. Verse 1, Solomon returned in consideration of all the oppression that is done in the world. He looked again at the world around him, and this is what he saw. He saw that there were those men who were oppressors, who exercised authority and power unjustly with wickedness and iniquity. If you look back at Ecclesiastes 3, 16 and 17, you see how Solomon has already discussed this topic. He turned and he called the people to look with consideration at this world. He noted that there are those who are oppressed, that cry, but have no comforter. These are those who are burdened by the abuse of power and authority. Yet, he says, there was no one to comfort them. Unjustly on the side of their oppressors is power. Solomon repeats yet again that the oppressed have no comforter. And so he looks at the world around him and he saw wickedness and iniquity. He saw people who abused power and those who were abused by those with power. Verse 2, therefore I praise the dead who were already dead more than the living who are still alive. Solomon thought that the oppressed that had died were more fortunate than the oppressed that are still alive and ready to die in their oppression. Verse four, or verse three, he says, yet better than both is he who has never existed, who has not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. So Solomon looked around in the world, and he saw wickedness, and he saw iniquity. First, he saw the oppressed who suffered greatly from oppressors, who grieved with tears, who sorrowed without comfort, and finally died. Second, there were those who were oppressed, who were still alive. Now, he thought that perhaps it would be better to have never existed than to suffer the evil work of oppression in this world without a comforter. To suffer in this world with nothing more than the things of this world, apart from God, would not be worth living, according to Solomon, as he's writing in this passage. At least with death, there would be no iniquity and wickedness. You're familiar with the patience of Job? Job 3, 17 to 18. There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners rest together. They do not hear the voice of the oppressor. And so looking at, at death, and we see that the voice of the oppressor has stopped. That there is finally the ceasing of the oppression that they suffered the troubling that they experienced. Yet for those who fear God, there is a comforter, and there will be justice. Ecclesiastes 3, 14 and 15, Solomon taught that there will be justice, that there will be a judgment, that God will judge. And so there is hope for those who fear God, who endure suffering in this world for the sake of righteousness. Solomon's point is made for those who have no hope and without God in this world. 
Second, we see the topic of underworking and overworking. In verses four through six, verse four, he says, again, I saw that for all toil and every skillful work, a man is envied by his neighbor. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. Men suffer under, also through envy, not only by injustice. Solomon described the man who works hard and is successful only to be envied by his neighbor. And he described such envy as vanity. Some look at this passage as teaching that this work is due to their rivalry with their neighbor, as though every labor and skill which they do is a result of their rivalry between man and a neighbor, or their toil, their work, comes from man's envy of his neighbor. However, as you read here in the New King James in verse 4, the point is, is, is clear that the fault is on the part of the envious neighbor. You have the one who toils, who works for a living, and no fault of his own is envied by his neighbor. The Ten Commandment law taught do not covet. In this particular passage, we see that here's a man who worked for a living and yet is envied by his neighbor. Verse five, he says, the fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. And so Solomon now described the man who worked hard and was successful, how his neighbor envied his success. And now he describes the fool who folds his hands. This folding of hands is a picture of sloth, a laziness. Folded hands are not working hands. The man who folds his hands is not working. And so such a man is said to consume his own flesh or ruin himself. Proverbs chapter 6, the book of Proverbs, we see that Solomon wrote in verse 9, How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So your poverty shall come on you like a prowler, and your need like an armed man. And so in that passage of Proverbs, we see how Solomon had taught of the folly of the slugger. The idea of a little folding of the hands to sleep. And so in this passage here in verse 5, we have a picture of laziness. Verse 4, we had a picture of a man who worked hard for a living and was envied by his, his neighbor. And perhaps that same neighbor may be the fool who folds his hands in verse 5, who is a sluggard, who's lazy, ends up ruining him his, his own life. Verse 6, he says, better a handful with quietness than both hands full together with toil and grasping for the wind. Solomon taught that it would be better to be content with little than to have much while being, being disturbed with envy and greed. And so sometimes a little is better than a lot if a little is accompanied with contentment. Rather than to have a lot and still want more, or perhaps to have little and just, and rather than working hard, uh, rather envying one's neighbor. The term quietness here is also translated as rest in Ecclesiastes 6 and 5. And so he says, better a handful with quietness or, or with rest, to have that kind of tranquility, contentment, satisfaction. And so he taught similar lessons, again, in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 15, 16 to 17. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord 
than great treasure with trouble. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted calf with hatred. And so he makes some comparisons, contrasts in Proverbs 15, 16 to 17. It would be better to have a little and to have the fear of God than to have great treasure with accompanying trouble. It would be better to have a, a meager meal where there were people who loved one another than to have a, a fancy meal filled with hatred. Passages like Proverbs 16 and 8, better is a little with righteousness than vast revenues without justice. Proverbs 17, 1, better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. And in Proverbs 19, 1, he says, better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament taught that the prophet of contentment and vanity of greed. And so he taught the prophet of contentment, and he also taught the vanity of greed, of covetousness. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verses 6 to 10, now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. If you read Paul's epistles to Timothy, you'll note that Paul does not teach that it is sinful to be rich. Man can be godly and still be rich. However, we also know that there is a problem with having a desire to be rich and loving riches. And so the idea of love, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The man who, whose heart is filled with those desires of covetousness and greed will lead to evil practices, often leading astray from the faith and having consequences. And he describes graphically as these people piercing themselves through with many sorrows. The rich are not necessarily happy and content. And Paul hits the point home in the book of Ecclesiastes. You can be a godly man. You can fear God and be rich. However, you can also be poor and fear God too and be content in, in both situations. Here in verse 6, he says, Better a handful with quietness, contentment, rest, than both hands full, together with toil and grasping for wind, the wind. And so someone who, who works, who works to, to get rich and yet never satisfied. Be better to be content with the little that you have than to, to have much, and not be content in life. Learning contentment is certainly a, a, valuable, a valuable thing. Verse seven, Solomon says, then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. So Solomon looked again at the world around him and what did he see? He saw vanity under the sun. He saw vanity in this world apart from God. Verse 8, he says, there is one alone without companion. He has neither son nor brother, yet there is no end to all his labors. Nor is, is his eye satisfied with riches. But he never asked, for whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? This also is vanity and a grave mis misfortune. So Solomon describes the man who, 
overworks. It's one thing to work for a living, work for what we have, and we ought to work. However, there are the, those people who overwork, who put too much into their work without any thought of anything beyond this world. According to Solomon, such a life would be a life of vanity. What is a man profited under the sun apart from God? And so he describes this man who overworks. Here's a man he describes as being without companion. And so he has no son or no brother. Literally, the word here is second. He has no second. There's nobody beside him. He's without companion. And yet, what does he do? He never stops working. Who is never satisfied, who never has enough. Why does he work in such a way? Here's a man who, who never stopped to ask himself a question why he continued to work and deprive himself in this world. Think about it. Here's a man without a, an heir, a legal heir, who would receive his inheritance after he was gone. Who would get it? Who would receive the, this inheritance after this man passed away? And yet, here he is. He has no second. He has no companion. He has no son or, or brother. And yet, there's no end to all his labors. He continues to work. He work, overworks. In fact, he's never satisfied with riches, never has enough. And yet, he never asked, why do I continue to do this? And so Solomon describes this as a grave misfortune. So here was a man without a companion, without a second, without a, a dependent, and yet he, he continued on in the way that he was living. Verses 9 to 12. Here in verse 9, he says, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. And so we see the value of a companion. Solomon taught that two are better than one. They have a good reward for their labor. Good reward or good return. And so he provides three supporting points in verses 10 through 12. Verse 10, he supports verse 9 by saying, For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. First, if either one of the two falls, one will be there to help lift his companion up. However, if he's alone when he falls, he will have no one to help him up. Perhaps you've been in this situation and you've fallen and, and your companion has helped you up off the ground. What about when you've fallen and you had no one to help? In this particular passage, he's teaching the value of a companion, of having someone together with you. Verse 11, he says, second, again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? So two are better than one. One, if they one falls, and two, if one is cold. So if one is cold and they lie down together, then they will keep warm. One will be able to warm up the other. But what about if, if you're by yourself and you're cold? And so here he's saying if two lie down together, they'll have warmth. By sharing their, their, their warmth, they can keep warm. Particularly if one is cold, the other can warm the other up. However, if he's alone and he's cold, he will have no one to help him, have no one to warm him up. Verse 12. He says, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. And so a third point that Solomon makes in support of, of the previous passages, he says that if one is confronted by his enemy, there's a chance that he may be overpowered. However, if together the two may be able to withstand the attack, they may be able to defend themselves. And so in that sense, two are better than one. How often have you heard the saying today, a modern day expression, two heads are better than one. 
Well, in this passage, we see a point that if the two may be able to better defend themselves than the one. Solomon gives a proverb. He says, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. And so threefold or three times a cord. The idea of while two are stronger together, three are even stronger. And so here you have a cord made of three strands being stronger even than a, a cord of two strands. And so a cord of three strands, he says, is not quickly torn apart. And so those passages teach the value of a companion in this world. Rather than being alone, having help is certainly better. Verses 13 to 16, he teaches how popularity passes away. Verse 13, better a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who will be admonished no more. Verse 13, Solomon teaches the value of wisdom, particularly those who will be admonished. It would be better to be poor and to be wise as a youth than to be old and foolish as a king who will never receive earnest warning and counsel or admonition. Some people will, will not learn. Some people will not receive correction well. But someone who is wise will learn from, from those uh, words of counsel. And so while it may be great to be king, it would be better to, to be poor and to be wise than to be old and foolish as a king who will not be admonished, who will not receive earnest warning and counsel. Proverbs 12 and verse 15. Proverbs 12 and 15, Solomon wrote, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Some people, because of pride, are unwilling to receive counsel. I can do it myself. Attitude. The way of the fool, particularly the one that the scriptures teach that those who uh, those who do not fear God. And these are people perhaps who think they are right in their own eyes. And, and in this case here, the way the fool is right in his own eyes, he's conceited, he's arrogant, he's haughty. But the person who heeds counsel is wise. Here's someone who, who's not afraid to admit that he, that he needs help, that he needs guidance. And so a king that will receive guidance is a, is a wise king. A wise leader. Verse 14, he says, For he comes out of prison to be king, although he was born poor in his kingdom. So, in, in the following passages, he teaches about a, a story about a king and a successor. And here Solomon speaks of a poor and wise youth who comes out of prison to be king. The youth was born poor in his kingdom. No, no particular person from history is identified in this passage. Uh, some have thought Joseph. However, there, there's nothing in the passage to indicate that he's speaking of, of Joseph or of anyone else in particular. Verse 15, Solomon wrote, I saw all the living who walk under the sun they were with the second youth who stands in his place. And so there was the second youth, the king's successor, who stood in the place of the first youth as king. The people were with the second king. This may suggest that he was popular with the people. One version reads that they thronged to the side of the second lad. And so we see perhaps the popularity of, of the successor, of the succeeding king, this second youth who stands in the place of the first. And so the people are there with him. Verse 16. There was no end of all the people over whom he was made king. 
yet those who come afterward will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and grasping for the wind. And so the second king was king over many people. And while the people were with him, when he became king, those who would come after would not rejoice with him as successor. And so we see that his popularity passed away as time passed as well. And so while the people, it appears, were with him in the beginning, as time went on, we see perhaps because of his foolishness, the people could no longer rejoice with him as king. And so Solomon wrote, surely this also is vanity and grasping for the wind. Again, vanity, uh, similar words, futility, frustration, uh, meaningless. And the idea of grasping for the wind, again, expressing some futility. Have you ever tried grasping for the wind? Again, like trying to squeeze oil in your fist and how it, it comes between your fingers. Uh, the idea of grasping for the wind, the idea, a picture of futility. Again, this story may be a, a parable, um, this, a parable that teaches the value of wisdom. The first youth who became king, while poor, was wise. And it appears that the second youth, the successor to the king, began his reign with popularity. However, it is implied that he was foolish and would not heed counsel during his reign. And so his popularity diminished. It doesn't say this in the passage, but perhaps he uh, became an oppressor of the people. Again, earlier, he, he spoke of those who were wicked and full of iniquity and who oppressed people. He spoke of people who were being oppressed, of those who abused their power and authority. So perhaps the king of this story did just that. Whatever he was, it appears that he was foolish and his popularity soon passed away. The people could no longer rejoice with him as king over his kingdom. We hope that this lesson has been helpful to you today. Uh, these 16 verses of chapter four. Lord willing, next time we'll continue with chapter five. We invite you to continue to study on your own. If you need to, review a previous lesson and and we encourage you to, to come back next time. We thank you for being here today. And Lord willing, we will see you again in the future. Thank you.